Okay, so let's discuss what was talked about in your breakout rooms. Um, what is folklore? Um, why is that fundamentally the African oral tradition? Your personal experiences with folklore? And then um, how was your experience reading the text? What questions did you have about the text? Who wants to start us off? I can start, uh, start us off. Sure. Sure. Well, the importance of folklore, especially in African culture, is a huge part of passing down traditions and stories of the past. And in each village, there would typically be like a story reader that would that his job was to explain these stories and pass them down. So like the uh, function of folklore is more than just a storytelling, but passing down of the culture to generations and keeping that tradition alive. And I'm, I don't know why, but I can't connect this word to anything but griot. Griot, that's, that's the person who yeah. tells the story. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Good job. Thank you, man. That's really um, a great understanding of how the folklore adds to the African oral tradition. Um, does anybody want to provide a definition or a working definition? It doesn't have to be a, a Webster's def definition, but a working definition of what folklore is. I can, I can go. Okay. Um, I put um, folklore is the expressive body of culture shared by a particular group of people. It encompasses the traditions common to the culture or the subculture or group. I like the way that you phrase that, Karina, an expressive body of culture. I really like that phrase. And I think the only thing I would add to your um, your musings is that it's, it's passed down orally, right? Folklore is an oral tradition. That, that That's the way to pass that culture down. Perfect. Um, who would like to share their personal experiences with folklore? Does anybody have any family histories or family stories that is told orally? Has anybody heard any type of folklore? Hey, hey Mr. Yeah. Yeah, I think I come across one. It's uh, called La Llorona. Okay. And it's something uh, me and my uh, family from Mexico, we discuss and, and we celebrate um, this uh, story is about uh, this lady who sweeps the uh, streets of Mexico with terror. And she's giving up these loud cries to find her missing children. However, this is mainly used just to uh, make sure we don't stay too late. But it's a good way to like, I don't know, express. Um, it's because Mexico kind of has like a dark side and like, I don't know, the story's just, it's just been around there for ages. And it's just really good. And, and I think Carlos, correct me if I'm wrong, but the story's kind of intended to give children a reverence for things that could happen to them that's not um, good, right? Like to kind of- yeah keep them, not to say take the innocence from them, but not to allow them to be naive, right? Like there is this other side of the of the country that is not so, you know, helpful. Exactly, yeah. Okay, that, that, thank you, that's a great example. Um, before we transition into my notes, are there any questions, well, let's do this. What was your guys' experience reading the text? Like how did it make you feel? Did you find it difficult? Um, was it hard to understand? Was the, the terminology Kind of difficult for you what was your experiences okay yes tonight said the boogeyman yeah that, that could be a form of folklore right um yeah so how was your guys experience with the text would it would it, would it how did it was it difficult for you would it how did it make you feel what was your affective experience or what questions did you have? Uh, I can share. Okay. <clears throat> so my thinking as I was reading the text was that it kind of reminded me of like my own native dialect in the sense that you kind of like shorten words a lot of times, like words ending with ing, you just take the g off. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking that's really similar to how we speak English in Singapore. It's like words that end with nt, you take the t off. So I found it actually like, I don't know, like almost like a breath of fresh air yeah. because, you know, even though it's like this type of English is from a different place, it's like, I feel the same, like, I feel the same like self-expression from it. And also I remember you described it as like, like African vernacular English, right? Yep. Yeah. So I, I was just, another thing I was thinking about was like, I wondered why you like why 
in America, they put such labels on these types of things. Because like, for example, speaking Chinese in Singapore is like, you just call it Chinese, right? Like the accent's different and some words sound kind of different, but at the end of the day, we just call it Chinese. You know, we don't call it like Singaporean vernacular Chinese or something. So that was what I had. So, so let, let's unpack that, Rohan, because I think you bring up a good point. And, and I think what you're being attentive to is more of a, a reflection of American culture than anything, right? Because he's saying, and, and Rohan, correct me if I'm wrong, right? He's like, yo, I'm curious as to why you phrase this as African-American vernacular English. Because in Singapore, like, that's just, it's just it's Chinese. Like, it's no, we don't have to put a connotation to describe who's speaking the language, right? It's just, it is what it is. Um, but, and he said, I, I don't know why it's done this way here in America, but, but let's, if you are to kind of take a step back and think about that, right. Um, for, I would say by and large, we have a pretty good understanding of American history. Why do you think the signifier of African American English or Ebonics for that matter? Why does that become a, a such a necessity here in the West opposed to other places? Why do you, why do you all think that is? Uh, maybe it's because like there's a sense of like outcasting uh, different forms of English. So um, it's just, yes, you, that's it, Rohan. You hit it on the head. It's it's to that's other, right? right? It's to, to distinguish between the proper speaking of English, which we would just call standard English, right, and then the bastardization of of the English language, which we will call Ebonics, African American vernacular, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Um, looking at the chat. Um, tonight, can you kind of explain, express a little bit more, verbalize what your experience was with the reading? Because I think you're probably not the only one. If your mic is working. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, so when I was reading, it's like, it's like if I was, if I was at a family reunion or something, and like the old heads were talking, and I'm kind of just listening in to the stories that they're telling, I would be able to understand it, but because I'm reading it and not hearing it, it made it really hard for me to get like, because usually when people are speaking in slang, they're also speaking with their hands. They're also reacting to what each other is saying. So you get more of an understanding of what's going on. But I think because I only had the words and I had to piece it together myself, that's where the confusion was. Tonight, did you read it out loud or read it to yourself? I read it to myself. If you would have read it out loud, it would have gave you that auditory sense to where you would have seemed more conversational and I think it would have made more sense for you. Um, looking at the chat, I'm sorry, you wanna say something tonight? tonight? Okay, um, looking at the chat, uh, Brianna kind of uh, agreed with Tanaya. Brianna, did you read it out loud also, or did you read it to yourself? I'm sorry, did you read it to yourself also, or did you read it out loud? Yeah, I read it to myself. Yeah, read it out. And that's why I try to um, give you guys that heads up. Last week, like, it's going to really be helpful to read this out loud because you hear the conversation juxtaposed to um, it kind of playing out in your head, and, it, and it, it's, it's harder to get an understanding. Um, okay. So let's do this. I'm going to transition into my notes. Um, I do ask that you guys grab a pencil and paper because you're going to need to take some, um, I want you guys to take some notes down on what I'm speaking in regards to. Um, so let's just think about what we've done so far throughout the semester. Um, I hope I was able to disturb your ontological understanding of who African people are, right? I gave you guys a pretty clear conception of who these individuals are we call Africans. Um, we investigated their depiction of the oral tradition through this conversation around the metro nefer, good speech. Um, we investigated their um, ethical system, right, through this notion of ma'at. Um, we talked about West African, pre-colonial West Africa, also how colonialism impacted West Africa through the works of Maladoma Patrice Ome. Um, we engage the tension between African languages and colonial languages through Ngugi. And then we explored 
the transatlantic enslavement experience through the poetic of Bisson. So now we're transitioning to the work of the oral tradition, right? And this particular work of the oral tradition is, the, is folklore. Um, next week we'll engage stories, but for folklore, right? And as Webster would define it, and, and I, low key, I believe it was Karina that gave us the definition. I actually like Karina's definition better, but Webster defines folklore as the uh, traditional belief, custom, store, and stories of a community passed down through generations by word of mouth, right? But this is what I want you guys to write down. Theoretical framework, okay? I'm gonna introduce a new theoretical framework to you all. Um, our first theoretical framework was African-American male theory, which states African, African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance, right? So we should all be somewhat familiar with that. That's our first theoretical framework. Our next theoretical framework is entitled Funds of Knowledge. I'll put that in the chat. So it's Funds of Knowledge. And the uh, intellectual who provided this um, framework for us is a sociologist slash educator by the name of Tara Yoso. And what funds of knowledge is, along with being a, a, a theoretical framework, it's a critique. Um, Tara Yoso is responding to the work of Pierre Baudot, which is a French philosopher and intellectual who asserted this notion of cultural capital. And what cultural capital is, is to understand why certain groups are able to obtain education of success and certain groups are not, right? And Bordeaux asserts the reason that the groups who are successful are able to achieve the success is due to cultural capital. What cultural capital may look like is the ability and the resources to go to the museum, the ability and the resources to go to the art exhibit, right? Um, when I place my children in sports, they're on the same team as their teachers are. So while they're while the kids are playing, right, I'm able to converse with my child's teacher and develop a rapport with my child's teacher, right? This is this notion of cultural capital. And Yoso argues that cultural capital has an elitist element to it, right? Because only certain people could go to the museums. Only certain people are going to art exhibits, right? So what she says to counter this notion of cultural capital, there's also these funds of knowledge that often don't get recognized in positions of academia or in professional settings, right? And funds of knowledge is the knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation, orally most of the times, that allows communities to understand their uniqueness or to help them navigate their place in the world. So this is, what this, under, this is what this notion of funds of knowledge is. And this, I want you guys to write this down. Knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation that allows the community to understand their uniqueness or allows them to navigate their place in the world. That's what this funds of knowledge is. What's also important about funds of knowledge, they're rarely recognized in what we'll call professional settings or educational settings, right? Um, funds of knowledge may be Abuela's tortilla recipe that you guys, that you pass down from generation to generation, right? Uh, grandma's gumbo recipe, sweet potato pie recipe, right? For me, I was always told for black people, we have to be twice as talented or, tw or work twice as hard even to get recognized, right? So that becomes a funds of knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation. So those are our two theoretical frameworks that we have on the table so far. Now, these theoretical frameworks become important because they help you as thinkers to create a baseline for your work, right? So you could work through these theoretical frameworks to have your audience be on the same page with you as you engage certain subject matter, right? So for example, um, actually before I even give the example, also when it comes to your midterms, to give you a very practical um, explanation for why these become important. When it comes to your midterm, out of the five questions that I offer you, you have to answer three. Each question 
each answer, excuse me, each answer must have and must utilize the theoretical framework. So you would work through these frameworks to answer your questions. So if I ask you how old are African people and why is this information important, right? Using a theoretical framework to answer that question may sound like this. According to African-American male theory, which states that African people are resistant and resilient, African people can be traced back 8 million years old. This becomes important because it situates them, their place in history as the original people, right? So this is how you could use this theoretical framework to answer these questions. And it will be required on your midterm to use and work through these theoretical frameworks to answer the questions. Um, does anybody have questions about the theoretical framework itself or the use of a theoretical framework? I have a question. Yeah. So when using a theoretical framework, it's not necessarily something that like you have a whole paragraph about. It's something that you would just include throughout the entire writing. Right. So oh. in the, go ahead, Tanai. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, it was just, I'm just trying to like uh, draw connections because sometimes like in other classes that I've had before, when they say, you know, include this piece of information, they always word it as like dedicate like a paragraph to it and then they'll count it. It's never really find a way to include that information throughout the writing, like continue to draw connections back to it. So it's a um, it's a framework. You don't necessarily have to revert back to it. So it's going to sound a lot different in answering a question than it would be if you're producing a paper, right? So if you're producing a paper, you might write in the introduction, I'll be working through the framework of African-American male theory. And that may be the only time that you address, you use that actual, not, I don't say that. Again. That'll be the only time that you write that framework in the introduction. And then when the readers know, okay, boom, I know that she's working through this framework that says that African people are resistant and resilient. And I'm going to look for that consistency in the work, right? Does, does that make a little more sense for you? Yes. Yeah. So it's also another way to think about it. Um, it's a theory, right? So, or a methodology is another way to think about it, right? So sociology has its own specified methodology when it comes to doing sociological work right? Um, history has its own methodology when doing historical work, right? Your framework kind of serves as that methodology. Like, I'm going to be working through this idea that African people are resistant and resilient. And my paper and my writing will reflect this, right? Oh. And, and, and don't try to put too much on it now. We'll kind of massage this out as we get closer to the midterm. But I just want to kind of make you guys aware of that. One, we're using these frameworks and I want you to kind of be a little bit more comfortable with them. Um, not to know everything, but just to be comfortable. Um, and and I'll, I'll make that make more sense as we get closer to the midterm. Um, okay. So this is the book that we pulled the um, excerpt from. It's titled Of Mules and Men. It's from Zora Neale Hurston. Give me a quick image of Mrs. Her of Miss Hurston. She is one of the... Um, Harlem Renaissance greats. She is a author, of course. She's a filmmaker. And I think most importantly, she's an anthropologist. Um, is anyone familiar with the science or this discipline of anthropology? Yes, no, kind of. So anthropology is the study, is it's a study of groups, right? It's a study of ethnicities. I'm gonna make a claim, and you guys can take it with it, you can agree with it or not, but I assert that anthropology is a fundamentally racist discipline. Anthropology came popular in the early 1900s, so when you hear the night, sorry, the early 19th century, so when you hear that 19th century, you want to think about the late 1800s, right? Why do you think I say that anthropology is a fundamentally racist discipline? It's the study of groups and group behaviors. Can I respond? Please. Um, I think 
fundamentally it could be racist only because usually when you're studying a specific group you're you're studying to answer a question so it can be racist based off what that question is how the question possibly could be how is this group inferior how can we improve upon the traditions and customs of this group why are the ways of being within this group incorrect compared to what this other group does it's not not necessarily to just understand that's what it appears to be surface level but when you like actually look into it it's more so a comparison and not a good hearted comparison and comparison to show inferiority to something that someone already thinks is the greatest version or the greatest way of being tonight have you took any anthropology classes no i mean you, you're absolutely correct so <laughs> you have a very clear understanding of that emiliano to to add to what tonight is saying can you put can you state what you put in the chat to me please in a way it could be like stereotyping so let me um, provide some further context. It's not, it's not in a way. It is the science of the stereotype. It's the uh, radix point, the starting point of these stereotypes. Because as anthropology is becoming um, popular as a discipline, the idea of racism is becoming to come onto the scene, right? And a lot of the early anthropologists were the ones who authenticated these racist stereotype notions, right? So another thing, and I want to say is eugenics. Yes, it is eugenics, um, which is the science of classifying racial groups based on their intellect, right? And, and it goes into like the size of the cranium will determine someone's intellect, right? And so with, with eugenics did through the use of anthropology, it state that the European is the top of the intellectual class. Um, those who are what they were called mongoloid at the time, um, like Asian descended, right? They would be second in line. Um, indigenous folks would be third in line. And then at the bottom of the totem pole, totem pole would be the Africans, right? And anthropology was the science that produced this line of thinking, right? Through this line of thinking, we also got things like your IQ test, um, things like your standardized testing, because they used the standardized testing as a mechanism to authenticate the stereotype of intellectual inferiority. Right. And this is something that just now in our society today, they're starting to think about this and reconsider the use of standardized tests. Right. But this is all something that um, stems out of the science of anthropology. Oftentimes, especially if we think, think about it, if we're talking about the late 1800s, who are the ones that are doing the research? What type of man is doing this research? What? ethnic group what population go ahead tonight white people right white men yep so by and large we have white men going into africa going into south america going into parts of asia and doing these investigations not speaking the language not understanding the customs or the cultures and then they produce these stereotypical um depictions of these groups and all of the Western world says, oh, okay, well, these are who these people are. These are the savage Africans, right? These are the barbaric and indigenous people, right? So this is why I say anthropology is a fundamentally racist institution. But in comes Zornel Hurston, right? Black woman on top of that. So not only a black man, but she's a black woman on top of that. So we have to take into consideration her intersectionality. She's trained under the father of anthropology, Franz Boas, right? And what she does, she's from, she's born in Alabama, she moves to Florida. She's born in, eight, sorry, 1891, okay? Um, but she wants to take what she learned from Franz Boas and research her community. So understand the distinction between what anthropology does as a discipline and what Zornel Hurston is doing as an anthropologist, right? She's not saying, I'm going to go to some foreign place and investigate them. I'm going to go back to my hometown and, and, and investigate them and do an anthropological research study on where I come from, okay? So she goes to um, Eatonville, Florida, Polk County, Florida, and New Orleans to produce this text. Um, this is around 1927 through 1928. 
and then she goes back again in 1931 to 32, right? And she takes these oral traditions and she places them on wax. She puts them on paper, right? And to me, what this book is also doing is an act of subversion to the discipline of anthropology. What does subversion mean? What does it mean to subvert something? Change the direct, <clears throat> change the direction of its course. Change the direction of its course to undermine, right? So this work is a work of subversion in my estimation. And if you get into the readings itself, the readings are articulating subversion. Think about the bear, the lion, and John. That's a story of diver a subversion, excuse me, right? Because what happens? The bear runs, runs up on John. John slices the bear up, right? The lion is smelling the blood's bear, the blood, the bear's blood, excuse me, and the bear knows this. And the bear knows that if the lion gets on him, I'm not in a position to defend myself. So what I'm going to do is outwit the lion and shift his attention to the man, John, right? So now John and the lion is beefing opposed to the bear being in this situation. So this is an act of subversion. Subversion is fundamental in the African experience, especially for those throughout the diaspora, those who had to go through the experience of enslavement, right? To survive, they had to be subversive, right? Now, subversion in these times may look like, and this is a real story, an individual was enslaved, he got a hold of a big box that he could fit himself into, he put a shipping address for Canada, hopped in that box and mailed himself to freedom. Right? That's an act of subversion. He outsmarted his oppressor to get himself free. Right? Subversion may be, we need to pack 50 barrels of hay, right? But I'm going to work hella slow and get just 30. Now, physically, yeah, I can pull 50, right? But I'm not going to kill myself for y'all ass, so I'm going to work slow and get my 30, right? It's an act of subversion. So this, this art that I call subversion is fundamental for survival for African peoples throughout the Americas, right? And she expresses this through the folklore of the text, as well as with the work that the text is doing itself. Um, if no one needs me to address any specific things about the book or the reading itself, we'll jump into our fishbowl. But if you do want me to address something, let me know now it would be a good time to do so. I have a question. Okay. So from reading uh, the folklore, what was, like, what am I supposed to, what story, like, what is the underlying lesson that I'm supposed to get from reading? This? Yes. Um, so for me, what the reason why I had you guys read this, right? Um, think about last week's reading and that notion of gumbo from a linguistic standpoint, right? We have the variety of African languages, coming together and then the English language being placed on top of it, you hear what that sounds like by the way that this book was written, right? Oh. Um, also, if you read, you see how customs, traditions, and knowledge is being passed down, right? The knowledge of how to eat fish the proper way. Um, the knowledge of how to warm yourself by the fire, right? How to get the cold off your back, right? Mm -hmm. So. I assigned this so you guys get the understanding of, of the work that folklore does, the importance of folklore in this thing that we call the African oral tradition, right? We really can't even have an African oral tradition if it was not for folklore. And so I chose this book because one, it presents you with folklore, two, the way that it's written, and then three, the way that it undermines and subverts this science that we call anthropology. So that's the reason for my, uh, for my assigning this. Um, what you are supposed to get out of it is really up to you. Um, so I'll ask you, I'm going to answer your question with a question tonight. What did you get out of the text? Well, from reading the text, I got, hmm, there's not really like a straight answer to that question, but when reading, I kind of got, you know, in life, there's always the person that 
is perceived as the best and that wants to be taken as the best. But then there's someone who has who has a greater ability. And once they begin to showcase that ability, they're talked down upon and they're looked at, well, he can't be the best because I'm the best. And then it's proven otherwise. So that's kind of just what it, it made me think like of uh, the story of an underdog kind of the underdog showcasing their greatness. Are you equating that to the story of the, the bear and the lion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And so for me, I didn't articulate as a story of the underdog. I articulate as a story of subversion, right? Because only the underdog can subvert because those who are in power don't need to subvert because they're in power. Right? So right. You're, you're, you're on the right track. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're getting what I want you to get at. And I, okay. I, that's the exercise. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right, so does, so keep in mind, uh, with the fishbowl, you could read your journal. Uh, you could discuss what was talked about in your uh, breakout rooms, um, or you could pull from my notes to articulate for the fishbowl. Is there anyone who wants to volunteer? I'll volunteer. Okay, thank you, Karina. Anyone else? I'll volunteer. Okay, Andy, thank you. Um, one more. Okay, I'll call on some people at random. Um, Gisela, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Gisela, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, I'm going to mark this as a pass, Gisela. Uh, I'm going to look back, though, to see if you already used the pass. Um, and depending on what that is, will determine how your participation is going. Um, Cydia, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Professor, can I participate? Yeah, go ahead, Imoyo. Um Cydia, are you prepared to fishbowl? I can't hear you. Like you're really slow. Oh, I am, but I'd rather participate next week if that's okay. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so this will be your pass, though. Okay. Thank you. All right. So for this week's fishbowl, we have Karina, Andy, and Emiliano. Um, whoever wants to set it off is on you. Uh, can I go first? Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Um, I guess, well, to bring it back to that like the question from the breakout room, uh, what is folk folklore? Uh, I put that it's like stories that can entertain, but also teach us something. Um, you know, going back to the funds of knowledge, like it's passed down like knowledge from generations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then from the story, like when I read it, uh, like I understood what they were trying to get at, uh, but what I put for my analysis, um, I put that, I believe we shouldn't take things for granted, even the little things. Um, there's always appreci appreciation to be given. Things shouldn't be done. They should be done correct. Um, which I, I think like we take the little things for granted, uh, even like eating fish or heating up. Um, I, I think we don't understand that how lucky we are. Like other people don't like have that um, privilege. So um you know I, I like the story it was pretty cool and and for the story about the the lion and the bear um i kind of had like a different takeaway from it um because i guess like in real life if a bear were to fight a, a human uh john um like he would the human wouldn't win so i guess i was looking at the point of view of from john like if you fight uh don't fight fair it's from a song from kendrick um because um but yeah, the, the line goes, if you fight, don't fight fair because you'll never win. And obviously, like, he didn't fight fair. He took out a, a blade and shanked them. And then when he fought the lion, he took out a gun and in, in order to win. Uh, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. I, I like the the end. Um, I think I'm going to circle back that back to that when we finish the fishbowl. Um, who's next? 
uh, can I go? Yeah. I would like to talk about the anthropology. Is that how you say it? Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I'm not really like too familiar with it, but based on what I heard from you, um, I would have thought that it had something to do with like the funds of knowledge, like how people like study, um, culture, like um, ethnic groups, mm -hmm. and see how their generation passed on like, um different knowledge but it doesn't have anything to do with that because you know it's more like finding different stereotypes to make white supremacy better in a way yeah, yeah that's pretty much it what i have today and, and emiliano I, what i hear from you you're advocating for what i would call an ethical anthropology right so instead of doing anthropology to create the stereotype why yeah. don't we do anthropology to research those funds of knowledge that's that's a really brilliant point emiliano Really good point. Uh, Karina? So I just want to share my experience on reading the text. Um, I had a hard time reading the text. I had to reread it, but I ended up reading it out loud, which helped me understand it a bit more because I began reading it to myself, but it was difficult to understand. But overall, it was really interesting, and I was able to connect folklore to the Hispanic culture. Um, like Carlos had said, La Llorona, that story has been like around for a long time and it was told and it was retold like to entertain frightened and disciplined children and I remember like growing up I was always told um behave or la llorona is gonna come and get you so like I could just connect that to that yeah yeah I think that's, that's a great connection and, and I think the um the two fit very well um if I, if I can I want to circle back to Andy because I thought about that too, is like this, how John won, right? Because like, and no way in hell you about to beat no bear or beat no lion, unless you have weaponry. And then, then I thought like, man, what a way to depict man, men, right? He, humans, right? Like the need to conquer nature opposed to, act, to live amongst nature. And, and to be more specified, I think that's really a European way to engage nature, right? Because if you look at indigenous cultures, by and large, the two fundamental things with indigenous culture it was the coexistence with nature and then the ability to learn from nature. And um, that is something that comes with modernity, that comes with European domination, this notion of having to conquer nature. Right. And, and only being able to do so with advanced technology, i.e. guns, knives, etc. Right. So I thought that was a very interesting um, connection that you made, um, um, Andy. And I think it's a really good point. Um, is there any other comments, questions or concerns you have about the reading? Anything else you would like me to address? Okay. Hold on a second. So for next week, so this one is, it was difficult due to the way that it was written, but the material that was, or the subject matter that was being discussed wasn't too heavy. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think what Zornel Hurston was talking about was real deep, um, but just the way that she talked about it made it a little bit more confusing. Um, Next week's reading is going to be the opposite. Very straightforward, um, very easy to read, beautifully written, masterfully written. Um, we're going to start getting into James Baldwin. But I, I want to give you trigger warning because the material and the subject matter is, is difficult. It's, um, it's triggering. It's hard to, to grapple with. But we're all adults. We'll get through it. Um, so for next week, we're going to engage... James Baldwin's going to meet the man. So you have three PDFs, but think of it as one whole reading. So you only need to do one journal entry, but make sure to read all three PDFs. And again, trigger warning. Uh, the subject matter of this is going to be a little uncomfortable, but it is what it is. You, you were adults, you'll get through it. Um, are there any other questions you all have for me before we call it a day? All right. You guys be well, be healthy.